Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist here with uh, lecture number 29. Um, so the last week that we were here, um, and I'm recording this as you're kind of working through these lectures, I'm working about a week ahead. Um, hopefully you are listening to the different lectures on the limbic system, and in particular, I hope you've moved on to our discussion of the amygdala. Now, as you've probably learned if you're listening to this, the amygdala is really critical critical for a lot of um, negative emotional responses, in particular responses such as fear and aggression. Um, and as we kind of saw, the amygdala has a lot of different outputs to different parts of the brain to basically help engage in fear-specific and aggression-specific behaviors, things like freezing or engaging in defensive aggression. Um, the amygdala also releases neurotransmitters such as nor, uh, basically makes contact with these uh, parts of the brain that release uh, neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and acetylcholine to help your body uh, get ready to um, respond in a variety of different ways, like that fight or flight response of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, one thing that I think is really important to note is that we are not slaves to our emotions. Um, we live in a world with people. And because we are, uh, not to borrow a meme, but uh, we do live in a society. And because we live in a society with other people, that means that we have to control our impulses and make sure that they're socially appropriate. And we want to make sure that we are basically engaging with our emotions in a way that is socially appropriate and not destructive. We can't go around punching people just because we feel like it. Our species has developed frontal lobes which help us control those emotional impulses and make sure that our emotions aren't the ones driving the car. Um, one of the things that you'll find if you look at other types of mammals, generally the majority of them do have lesser developed frontal lobes, and as a result, they have uh, less control over their instinctual behaviors. So let's take a look at some of the major uh, portions of the frontal lobe. So uh, all of the cortex that is basically in front of the motor association cortex, which you can see with my cursor here. So here's our motor association cortex. This section here in purple or blue is basically your prefrontal cortex. It is the most developed in humans. It occupies about one third of total brain space. Um, the frontal lobe is really critical for a lot of uh, cognitive functioning, especially those that are what we would consider higher level or higher order. Um, so things like planning, things like motivation, understanding of personality traits, who we are, what drives us. And typically, um, what we tend to do when we talk about the prefrontal cortex, this portion here in blue, now all of this is the prefrontal cortex, but this portion in blue is what is referred to as the lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, if you're interested in higher order cognitive function, this particular area that I'm kind of circling with, with my uh, cursor, is called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. But we're actually going to spend a little more time talking about this area here coded in green, which you can better see if we take a ventral view of the brain here. This is what is called the orbitofrontal cortex, and we're going to spend a good majority of uh, today's lecture talking about this particular area. So part of the reason that we call it the orbitofrontal cortex is because here is where our uh, orbitofrontal cortex tends to be. Right here, those are the orbits that are known as your eyes. So the orbitofrontal cortex gets its name because it sits directly on top of the eyes somewhat. So the orbitofrontal cortex has a lot of different inputs and outputs, just like the amygdala does. It has inputs and outputs to the medial temporal lobe, including the amygdala. It has inputs and outputs to the mesolimbic pathway and other portions of the uh, prefrontal cortex. Now, just as a reminder, um, 
The ventral tegmental area in the mesolimbic pathway is largely a part of our reward circuitry of the brain. This is an area that produces a lot of dopamine, as you might remember, and it's really important for a lot of addiction and reward-seeking behaviors. So generally, the things that we enjoy doing or the things that make us happy or the things that make us feel joy uh, tend to um, involve that circuit. So the orbitofrontal cortex receives sensory information from the body as well as information about previous experiences and about the emotional aspects of events from the amygdala. So it gets a lot of inputs uh, from these different areas. The outputs, um, particularly to the prefrontal cortex, can help modify behavioral responses to various events and can basically help us select a socially appropriate behavior. So we're using prior information to help guide our current behavior in emotional events. Now, I will mention that one of the major roles of the orbitofrontal cortex is to inhibit the emotional responses of the amygdala. So the majority of the outputs um, of the orbitofrontal cortex to the amygdala are inhibitory. It is the orbitofrontal cortex's job to try to inhibit the amygdala. So let's talk about um, research that has been done on the orbitofrontal cortex and what the orbitofrontal cortex really seems to be critical for. We can also look at what happens when this part of the brain is damaged. So first, what we're going to look at is something that is referred to as the Iowa gambling task. So what you're looking at here are four different packs of cards. Now, some of these decks are what we call good decks. They are not very risky. So what this means is that if I draw from a good deck, um, generally, I'm not going to get a huge payoff from it. So I won't necessarily get a huge payoff. But um, if I lose money from those good decks, um, I don't lose too much. So they have a small payoff and a small loss. Now, on the other hand, uh, we do also have risky decks or what we might consider a bad deck. Um, they tend to carry a larger payoff, but they also have larger losses. So some of these are going to be bad and very high risk. They tend to have a larger payoff and large deductions. Now, you don't know ahead of time which of these decks are good and which of these decks are bad. The only way to learn from the only way to learn which is good and which is bad is to play the game. And what we tend to find is that most people without orbitofrontal damage uh, do learn to stick to good decks that have smaller payoffs but also smaller losses. And they stay away from the bad decks and they generally will earn more money over time. So what else do we know about this task? Um, one of the things that we can actually do is look at a skin conductance response as people are uh, taking part in this task. So the skin conductance response has been used to understand risk-taking behaviors. So the skin conductance response basically um, is designed to measure small changes uh, in perspiration um, that happen uh, usually during things like risky situations or fearful situations. So something that's kind of interesting is that when you're in a fearful situation or when you're in a risky situation, very, very small amounts of perspiration in your skin increase. Um, this isn't necessarily something that you'd be able to detect. So if I'm sitting watching a scary movie, all of a sudden my hands are not going to be covered in sweat. But if I look at a skin conductance response, what I might see is a small change in my skin's capacity to conduct current passing through it. Um, 
And that might mean that on a microscopic level, I am perspiring a little bit more. And um, generally, increases in the skin conductance response do reflect enhanced arousal in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so one of the things that we find is that generally your skin conductance response will increase when you sweat, even if it's at a level that is not perceptible to you. Uh, and generally what we find when we do a skin conductance response during the uh, Iowa gambling task, generally um, people get a bad feeling before they take a risk. Um, generally they will report when they have that bad feeling and at the same time, we're also tracking their skin conductance response. And so uh, you can actually see here, here are instances where people reported a bad feeling before uh, drawing from a bad deck. And what we actually find is that the skin conductance response uh, is very briefly enhanced. So the skin response actually shows a change uh, reflecting sweating. So the idea behind this is that this sympathetic uh, response will signal help to guide people away from risk-taking behavior, uh, like drawing from bad decks. And we will typically find that that skin conductance response increases much more um, right before you draw from a bad deck. So this is kind of your brain and your body's way of telling you, hey, this could go very, very badly for you. Maybe you shouldn't make this choice. Now, what's interesting is that this is what happens under normal circumstances, right? What happens if the orbitofrontal cortex is damaged? So as we kind of saw, um, the skin conductance response will, all, will typically happen right before you draw from a bad deck. Somebody who has a damaged orbitofrontal cortex will show a weakened skin conductance response prior to a bad deck draw. So this skin conductance that we saw Typically, if you have orbitofrontal damage, you will not have this response. Additionally, so this is what we're seeing physiologically, behaviorally, we see that our orbitofrontal patients will continue to draw from bad decks. They don't learn from their behaviors. Now, interestingly enough, the amygdala, if you damage the amygdala, this also impairs the um, skin conductance response. Um, and we know based on research that the amygdala is really critical for stimulating the autonomic responses associated with risk-taking behavior. Um, there are outputs that the amygdala has to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus releases hormones that are involved in sweating. So the amygdala is really important for producing that physiological response to risk. So what this kind of tells us is that the orbitofrontal cortex is really critical for interpreting these physiological signals associated with a bad deck draw, and it enhances them through outputs to the amygdala in anticipation of risk. So it's basically taking all of this physiological input and basically saying, hey, Maybe this is a bad idea. And this is what is known as the somatic marker hypothesis. The idea being that you need to interpret your bodily signals to know whether something is safe or not. So what this kind of tells us is that the orbitofrontal cortex is really critical for inhibiting risky behaviors or risk-taking behaviors. So given the link between these different regions and the role of the orbitofrontal cortex in controlling different emotional responses, as of 2005, we do consider the orbitofrontal cortex to be a part of the limbic system. Um, in addition to looking at the skin conductance response uh, in the Iowa gambling task, there has been additional evidence from neuroimaging studies to show that the orbitofrontal cortex does play a role in risk-taking behaviors. So what you're looking at here is another type of a gambling task. And so um, here, Participants are basically instructed to choose whether to bet 
or to bank a certain number of chips that they have. So here they've got four chips. They're basically asked while they are in the fMRI scanner, should they bank it and stock it away or should they gamble it? And basically if you keep winning over and over and over again, based on what you know about gambling, the more that you win, the greater the likelihood that a loss is going to pop up. So the more that you win, the greater the likelihood that you will soon experience a loss of those chips. Um, so what's interesting is that the more that you are winning, the greater the likelihood of that impending loss. And what we actually find is that for healthy patients, so patients with no uh, orbitofrontal damage, um, at all, we tend to find that the orbitofrontal cortex increases its activation in anticipation of that loss. So um, the orbitofrontal cortex is active in anticipating that loss, and it's also very active when we actually do lose money as well. So it's active during a loss in addition to the anticipation of that loss. So again, it's becoming active to basically help curb risk-taking behaviors. Additional research uh, has been done um, looking at people who are pathological gamblers compared to healthy controls. Um, so they looked at um, they looked at an fMRI study with controls and pathological gamblers during a gambling task, and what they actually found is that. Um, Basically, the more of a pathological gambler you are, the less orbitofrontal activity you have. So what you're looking at here is bold response. Um, so we're looking at that blood oxygen level dependency, which signals activity in the orbitofrontal cortex. Here on our x-axis, we see gambling severity. And you can kind of see that the more of a gambler that you are, the more severe your pathological gambling, um, the lower your orbitofrontal cortex activity is. Um, so generally, less activity in the orbitofrontal cortex is associated with more gambling behavior. And again, this largely happens because of orbitofrontal activity suppressing that risk-taking behavior. So let's take all of this back to our mesolimbic pathway, that reward circuit that we talked about. Now. Pathological gambling actually shares a lot of commonalities with drug addiction. Um, in fact, in terms of different types of behavioral addictions, such as shopping addiction, gambling addiction, sex addiction, and so on, uh, gambling addiction looks the most like drug addiction in a variety of different ways. It's associated with greater financial losses, losses of uh, security, um, compared to other types of behavioral addictions. So it looks more like a drug addiction. And again, like other types of addictions, the reward circuit probably plays a huge role here. So we learned about this circuit previously when we talked about dopamine and drugs. So just as a reminder of this circuit, the mesolimbic pathway basically connects the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain to the nucleus accumbens, um, which is a subcortical nucleus and is also part of the limbic system. So our ventral tegmental uh, area neurons are dopaminergic. They're gonna send their output to the orbitofrontal cortex, areas like the amygdala, uh, the nucleus accumbens, and so on. And it's believed that these connections are important in addiction. These pathways mediate reward-seeking behavior and are hijacked by drugs of abuse, and they can also be hijacked by behavioral addictions. And it's believed that this circuitry is also impaired in pathological gamblers, and these previous findings are consistent with this idea. So now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. So we're gonna talk about sociopathy. And I want to be very, very clear about what sociopathy is. Um, there is not 
a scientific or psychological diagnosis for sociopathy. Um, so sociopathy is a term that refers to basically the condition of being a psychopath. If it is diagnosed, um, it's usually going to be referred to as antisocial personality disorder. And that's largely going to be more focused on behavioral aspects. Um, so sociopathy is often marked by lack of conscience or remorse. Uh, typically, these people will be incredibly impulsive. They might engage in pathological lying. They have an impaired ability to delay gratification. They have poor judgment. Um, they are often prone to boredness, not easily satisfied, um, somewhat narcissistic, not always outwardly aggressive, though it can be common. Generally, they fail to learn from experience. Um, despite all of this, they do tend to have normal intelligence, so they don't have intellectual impairments. And it has been suggested that at least 15% of prisoners might present with sociopathy. So what does this have to do with the orbitofrontal cortex? Well, I'll kind of get there. But before we get to that connection with the orbitofrontal cortex, we're going to talk about the role that sociopathy plays in different types of gambling tasks. So this is data looking at children that were identified uh, by their teachers as either having uh, psychopathic tendencies or not. So these boys were identified by their school teachers. Many of them had been expelled based on their behavior. And it was reported by their teachers that they acted in charming ways that seem insincere, which is another kind of hallmark of psychopathy or sociopathy. Emotions were shallow. Um, does not feel bad or guilty, is not concerned about the feelings of others, gets bored easily, becomes angry when corrected, acts without thinking, and engages in risky or dangerous activities. All of these were statements that were produced by teachers with regard to these children with psychopathic tendencies that, that were kind of marked by their teachers. Um, when they engaged in a gambling task very very similar to uh, the iowa gambling task um, generally what you can kind of see so we have our diamonds these are our children with psychopathic tendencies our comparison children are in squares now i would say take this with a huge grain of salt because in certain cases some of these error bars overlap but what i'd like you to pay attention to is the overall pattern of results so you can kind of see that initially both the children with psychopathic tendencies and the comparison group are drawing from risky, they're making risky decisions, they're drawing from bad decks. Um, but over time, you can kind of see that that risk taking behavior in our control group drops. Now, in comparison, you can kind of see that um, our children with psychopathic tendencies, they tend to say, stay at a pretty solid level of drawing from bad decks. They don't really modify their behavior based on the losses that happen. So they continue to draw from bad decks over time while the control group quickly learn to avoid the bad decks. Now let's be very clear. This is correlational data. Now we can only assume that the orbitofrontal co cortex is involved based on the research that has been done, but there could be other regions that are involved in drawing from these decks. So the orbitofrontal cortex might play a role here, but this is not causal data, and the orbitofrontal cortex was never actually discussed in the context of the study. Researchers have found that orbitofrontal volume uh, is uh, reduced in people that have uh, psychopathic tendencies. So what you're kind of looking at in this image, uh, this image is greater activation for controls versus uh, people with psychopathic tendencies. You can kind of see that these areas that tend to be enhanced in control participants do correspond to parts of the orbitofrontal cortex. So we can also look at um, 
metabolic activity in the orbitofrontal cortex with a PET scan. So um, what you are looking at here is PET activity in both uh, controls. So this was based on research with prisoners. Um, and we're looking at the activity in the amygdala and the orbitofrontal cortex. Now remember that PET scans look at the um, metabolic activity of glucose. Basically, the more glucose that a part of the brain metabolizes, the more active that area is presumed to be. So there are three different groups that I kind of want you to look at here. So here in this dark gray bar, we have what are known as our predatory killers. These are basically our your cold-blooded killers that don't really show a lot of remorse and they're kind of preying on people. Um, on the other hand, this lighter gray bar, these are what are known as effective killers. These are people that commit crimes of passion. They get upset, they get angry, and they kill somebody in the heat of the moment. Um, so, we have our two different murderer groups, and then we have our comparison group. So here's what's especially kind of interesting here. So generally, we don't really see a lot of differences between our killers and our comparison groups with metabolic uh, uptake of glucose in the left amygdala. But look at the right. Look at how much more activity in the amygdala is going on with our predatory and our effective killers relative to our comparison group. So the amygdala, at least in the right amygdala, we're seeing a lot more activity. On the other hand, look at the orbitofrontal cortex. So here in both lateral uh, prefrontal cortex and medial prefrontal cortex, we actually see less activity in our predatory and effective killers relative to controls. So we see the same pattern in both effective killers and cold-blooded killers, um, even though the effective killers typically are not as extreme. Now, you will notice, as I mentioned, that the right activity tends to be lateralized uh, in the amygdala. This is consistent with a lot of evidence that highlights the right amygdala and the right hemisphere in general as being important for emotional processing. Um, generally, killers that kill out of emotion, those crimes of passion, um, are going to have an overactive amygdala and an underactive orbitofrontal cortex. So that underactive orbitofrontal cortex means that the amygdala's processing emotion can't really be inhibited. Now, predators do show a similar pattern, um, but there are other differences between these types of killers. Um, other frontal regions might be underactive or smaller in predators. Um, work is being done, but it's kind of hard to do research on prisoners. There tend to be some ethical considerations that have to be taken into account. Having said that, though, what you do generally see is that for murderers, you will tend to find an overactive amygdala and an underactive orbitofrontal cortex. So now let's talk a little bit about the potential genetic links in sociopathy. So there has been some research that um, there is a genetic polymorphism in the monoamine oxidase gene. Now, for those of you who may not remember, monoamine oxidase is an enzyme. Remember, if it ends in A's, it's an enzyme that's basically designed to break down monoamines. Um, so it breaks down dopamine, it breaks down serotonin, and it breaks down norepinephrine. Now, generally, if you have high expression of this gene, that means that your monoamine oxidase is working very, very well. And what it means is that you will tend to find that people with this high expression will have reduced levels of things like dopamine, uh, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that low serotonin, now we've talked about the role that low serotonin might play in depression, and in a couple of lectures, I'll show why uh, the low serotonin hypothesis of depression may not be the case. But we do know that low serotonin is associated with reduced orbitofrontal activity, 
increased aggressive behaviors and sociopathy. So you can potentially give monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are types of antidepressants, or SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, as a treatment. There's not a lot of data on this, though, and these treatments may not be very effective. So there could be a genetic link to sociopathy. We also have some research that it can be acquired. Um, so it really depends on um, when you get brain damage in life. So in addition to genetic impairment, brain damage can um, produce sociopathy. Brain injuries can lead to sociopathic tendencies, but the age at which the damage occurs is key to the outcome. So if you have orbitofrontal damage in infancy, that actually looks more like true sociopathic behavior. Um, these people that have orbitofrontal damage early in life um, will have trouble anticipating the consequences of their behavior. They will be very impulsive. They might engage in impaired moral reasoning. They may actually enjoy hurting other people. Now, on the other hand, remember that generally the older you are, um, typically your brain's not necessarily going to be able to compensate for that damage. So one of the things that we tend to find is that orbitofrontal damage in adulthood is less detrimental with respect to sociopathic tendencies. Um, typically, those with orbitofrontal damage in adulthood, they typically have trouble anticipating the consequences of their behavior. Um, they are impulsive, but they are capable of engaging in moral reasoning and they don't enjoy hurting other people. So uh, the sociopathy that results from um, brain damage is going to be far more uh, damaging if it happens early on in life. So in general, what do we know about orbitofrontal damage? Um, the different thing, here are some different types of things that we will see happen. Um, first of all, we will potentially see acquired sociopathy, disturbed social behaviors, so inappropriate social behaviors, um, not really taking, uh, thinking about the consequences of behavior. We will see poor uh, decision making, impulsivity, an impaired theory of mind, and uh, theory of mind is basically something that enables you to understand what other people are thinking and predict somebody's emotions and behavior that result from your actions. That might explain why uh, a lot of people with sociopathy um, or acquired sociopathy through orbitofrontal damage have difficulty anticipating the consequences of their actions. Um, they also will generally have reduced inhibition possibly even obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder is largely regarded as a disorder of impulse control. Um, OCD is actually associated with abnormal activity and reduced volume in the orbitofrontal cortex. So you have these emotional anxious responses and the orbitofrontal cortex can't really inhibit the amygdala, so you might engage in these ritualistic behaviors to help calm yourself down and reduce your worries. So we're going to go ahead and stop here. Next time, we are going to talk about one of the most famous cases of orbitofrontal damage. We will talk, yes, about Phineas Gage.